Hey, Jim Bergman with MeasureQuick. Wanted to take a few minutes today and go over uh, one of the diagnostics we get. A lot of people always think that when you have low airflow that you're going to flood the compressor, you're going to have no superheat. And that is not necessarily true. And so I'm on a fixed orifice system, little ton and a half system here. Uh, it's running perfectly right now. We have uh, about 17.2 degrees of subcooling. Our target is 12.6, so we're in that five degree range of, oh, sorry, superheat, 17.2 degrees of superheat, seven degrees of subcooling, charges all in range. Um, we'll go ahead, I'm gonna turn on some trends here. You can see that after I started the system up, our superheat is pretty stable here, and subcooling is pretty stable. And now we're gonna create what we're gonna call a low airflow situation. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go ahead and just pull the door off the air handler. And what's gonna happen here is all the air is gonna be pulled straight into the fan and we're gonna bypass the coil effectively, right? So all the air is just going into the sides here. No air is going through the evaporator coil. Now let's take a look at our trends here. This is a trend to superheat and subcooling. The red line is the, is the superheat. You can see right away the superheat is shooting way up and our subcooling is starting to trend down and our superheat now is coming back down again. So well, why is this happening? Well, what you gotta remember is pressure on a system changes much faster than the line temperatures do. The refrigerant has mass. The refrigerant uh, takes time to cool down uh, once you drop the pressure on it. And so, but the pressure's gonna change very quickly. So we have this, what's, what's effectively happening is the saturation temperature, the pressure's dropping down very, very quickly. In fact, if we look here, we'll go back to the gauges for a second here. We're at a 26 degree coil right now. Pressure changed very quickly, refrigerant temperature did not. So what happened is the super calculation because the saturation temperature went really low and the suction line temperature still high, it's showing us this really high superheat for a second. But now if we go back to our trend again here, you can see that, oops, and I hit the, uh, let me go back one here, I'm on pressures right now. Outdoor air, enthalpy, return air, go back to superheat and subcooling. You can see that our superheat went up, it came down below the target, but we're still running about six degrees of superheat right now. So our superheat did drop down, but the system is not flooding, right? In fact, what we're seeing right here is called charge migration right now. We're seeing another drop here. We'll let it run for a few more minutes here. But refrigerant is basically coming out of the condenser, going into the evaporator. There's no heat energy to boil that refrigerant away. So the refrigerant is stacking in the evaporator coil and we're actually seeing it build up in there. That's why the superheat's going down. The condenser's starting to starve because it's not getting that refrigerant back. So the charge has migrated over into the evaporator coil, right? Very important concept to understand. But the system is still not flooding. In fact, we'll go back here. We'll tap on this. We're at 3.3 degrees of superheat and coming up a little bit. Now, we're gonna let this run for a few more minutes, but this is an important concept to understand because just because we have low superheat does not mean that we're flooding. In fact, if, if that were to happen, every time we have a bad blower motor, we'd end up with a bad compressor and that just doesn't happen. Now this is a fixed orifice metering device, which is like the worst case scenario. A TXV's job is to control superheat. So the TXV would continue to close down once it sensed this evaporator coil was flooded and would probably maintain around eight to 10 degrees of superheat, if not higher in the 12 degree range, because that's the function of a TXV. But even this fixed orifice, even though we're in effect what we call flooding the coil, meaning filling it up, is still maintaining a superheat of three to five degrees so that we're not sending liquid refrigerant back into the uh, condensing unit here. So now you can see here, we'll tap this again here and we're at 3.8 degrees. We'll go back to the gauges for a minute just so we can see that. So we're at a 25 degree coil. Our, our head pressure's dropped, our suction pressure's dropped, our superheat has dropped, and our subcooling has dropped along with our suction line and liquid line temperature. So what's, again, what's happening is we've moved the refrigerant over into the evaporator. We're starving a condenser. This is all symptoms of low airflow. 
Now if we go to measure quick and we tap on the triangle there, it's saying our fault is low load on the evaporator, number one. Well, obviously we have no load on the evaporator. It's telling us that the coil will make ice. That's correct, sensible capacity is low. Now it's telling us we have a potentially blocked, fouled or evaporator or airflow. So this is a, basically simulating an evaporator coil that's completely blocked off. We'll probably add in something here about blower motors bad, but most people would be able to fill the register here and feel they have no airflow coming out if the blower motor was in fact bad. But you can see that the coil, everything got picked up. And then there's seven symptoms of that. And then there's also symptoms of a, of a uh, potential kink or restriction in the suction line. Uh, but these are, again, these are symptoms of it, not necessarily the fault. So the top line fault is check your airflow, check your evaporator, something's blocked off there. Now, I'm gonna go back here and we are going to take a look here. So you can see our, our system's pretty well stabilized out, right? We understand now why we had that sharp increase of superheat initially due to our saturation temperature dropping faster uh, than our, our, our liquid temperature could or than our suction line temperature could. See our superheat's sort of trending up here a little bit, subcooling's trending down a little bit, but they're very minute, everything's sort of where it's at. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the blower door back on the unit. And what do we think is gonna happen? Because it's, it's very important to understand, this is when we get systems that have, when we do have comp compressor failure, like on systems that may be zoned or have other issues, what do you think is gonna happen now? That, that whole coil right now is full of liquid refrigerant. What do you think is gonna happen when all of a sudden I put massive amounts of airflow across it? Well, let's find out. So I'm gonna go ahead and put the door back on here and I've got to get my screws here I dropped them one I have to recover it in a minute here we'll find it and come over here let's take a look at our at our pressure as soon as I put the door back on now as soon as I put that door back on you'll see that superheat just went to zero in fact let's go here for just a second and we'll go back to our gauges you can see we're at zero degrees of superheat now, why did that happen? Well, what's happening is immediately when I put that cover back on that panel, the panel back on, huge amounts of air went in through that evaporator coil. That coil was full of liquid refrigerant right to the top, right? And it, all that air going across there caused that refrigerant to start to boil very quickly. And now all that refrigerant's carried back and in, into the compressor, into the suction line. The only thing making this unit survive right now is it has a little accumulator on it that's catching that liquid before it goes into the compressor. Otherwise, we probably would be hearing some really, really loud noises from the compressor or we might even damage the compressor on this. But this is where if we have a blower motor that maybe cycles off because of a bad cap and then restarts in 10 minutes or cycles off and restarts, that's where you're gonna have compressor failure. That's where you're gonna take the liquid that's in here and force it in the compressor this is called hunting and flooding uh, when you have that situation. So now we'll go back to our graph for just a minute. See our superheat's coming back in the range, subcooling's coming back in the range, everything's going back the way we suspect it. But when we come up, when we, when we create problems or faults in our lab, then we're actually detecting them with a the software. That's how we engineer things here. It's, it's, it's not somebody guessing what's gonna happen, it's somebody actually making it happen. So when we test a metering device that's oversized, well, we put an oversized metering device in. When we test for low airflow, we put low airflow. When we test for a blocked evaporator coil, we actually physically block the evaporator coil. It's not guessing how equipment operates, it's knowing how the equipment operates and then verifying the software can pick it up. So hopefully you got a little bit out of this video. I thought it was just inter interesting to see that systems definitely do not flood when they have no airflow. They're pretty well protected and it's just uh, some, some, some basic, simple uh, operation, but I thought it was cool to see anyway. This is Jim with Quick. Thanks a lot for watching.